if you remember the mid to late 90s, you know boy band groups took over. Now, one of the groups you may have heard of was the Backstreet Boys. They had a song that said, I want it that way. And then also another group that came right after them called NSYNC that had a song saying, baby, bye, 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 bye. Now, there's a bigger story that goes on between both of them on how they came together and the story behind the story. And today we have a three-part series on Netflix called Dirty Pop, The Boy Band Scam. And it's talking about a guy by the name of Lou Pearlman who actually put both of these groups together. And he ran the longest-running Ponzi scheme in history of 30 years, stealing over $500 million and only $10 million was recovered. So we're going to break down these three parts one episode a day. And if you're new to the channel, my name is Modi J. We're getting back into documentaries. And if you want to hear more about Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, and how they had to get away from Lou Pearlman in order to thrive and succeed and make the money that they were deserved, then hit your subscribe button, turn on your notification bell so you get something every time I upload. Make sure you hit that like button. Hey, we're on that road to 50,000 subscribers. So like NSYNC said, bye, bye, bye. So if you ain't hit that like button, say bye, 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 and hit that like. But let's go ahead and jump into it. This is part one of Dirty Pop, the boy band scam. They start the documentary off showing the Backstreet Boys. Now we're showing them at the peak of their career. They're just showing us and building up Luke Perlman and how he transitioned from the Backstreet Boys to bringing in NSYNC with the same exact playbook. So right after this, they show Lou Pearlman, and they say he's the only person that has a skill of going out and finding these young, attractive, handsome young men, putting them together, teaching them how to sing and how to dance and making a boy band. Let me just make this clear. No matter how cool you were, no matter where you were from, you knew a Backstreet Boy song or you knew an NSYNC song. And Lou Pearlman was the man behind all of this. But let's not get it twisted. These young men, they all had the talent. It's just the deals that they were in and the opportunity that was provided to them by Lou Pearlman, they had to take it. We get a little bit into Lou's personality, and he even says, the moment that boy band groups would die off is the moment they stop having girls. Because girls are the number one consumers and fans of these boy band groups. And we're starting to see that Lou, he's all about the money, dollar dollar bill. Now, how they did this documentary is they altered Lou's video to make it seem like he's the one narrating his book. But when he starts off, he says he got introduced to a guy and he had a group called New Kids on the Block. Now, he never heard of him. And at this point, Lou Pearlman was renting out charter jets, private planes for celebrities, athletes to travel around. Now, he was wondering how did this group of five young kids, New Kids on the Block, how were they able to afford to be able to fly around the country in these private jets? And this is where he gets the idea of the boy band. We start getting introduced into the Backstreet Boys. Now, the first person we're introduced to is Howie. And he's explaining that Lou had deep pockets, meaning he had a lot of money. And while he's out and about, he lived in Orlando and his dad called him and said, hey, they're looking for a boy band group. So what did he do? He went out and he started contacting other people that he knew that could sing. And eventually they got five people together, which was the original Backstreet Boys, and they went to go audition for Lou Pearlman. One thing we're going to see is a reoccurring thing with Lou Pearlman. He's always going to have his group singing, no matter what, wherever they're at, a restaurant, at a meeting, out at the park. He's always going to have them sing in front of people, trying to get them that exposure, trying to get them that practice, those reps in. Now, we'll find out why he's doing this a little bit later on in part three. But as of right now, you're trying to get an understanding of who Lou is. And it seems like he's just an innocent manager trying to get these boys ready for the real world when they become mega pop stars. One thing you can say about Lou in the early stages of Backstreet Boys, he had them on the road. Were they doing major shows? No. They were singing in classrooms. They were singing in auditoriums, gymnasiums. They were going on the high school tour. You got to remember, they're between the ages of 16 and 18 at this time. And everyone's eating it up. New Kids on the Block had a bunch of hits, but now it's Backstreet's turn. And Lou, a perfect salesman. So you're seeing him putting them out on the road. He's feeding them, taking care of them. They all get so close to Lou, they start calling him Papa. Now we get introduced to Melissa. Now she became the assistant and music rep for Lou Pearlman 
and his group, Continental Trans. Now, when she first met Lou, he asked her, did she know anything about boy bands? And she said she liked new kids on the block, but she didn't really know much. But Lou, he took a liking to her and brought her on the road, and he treated her like everyone else, like a daughter, like family members. So for her, her job was to make sure that everyone stayed in order, made sure everything was taken care of, and everything was booked. She even said Lou bought the boys, Backstreet Boys, a million-dollar tour bus when they first started off. Now, at this point, they're just starting off, and this is what you would call a garage band. Now, they're just showing us some of the behind the scenes. Some of them are messing up. Some of them are hitting the notes. But this is no different than any band you have. You also have Aaron Carter, Nick Carter's older brother, who was here. And, you know, they're going at it. He's saying, hey, you ain't on the right note or whatever. And you see them farting around. They making jokes. But this is the upcoming in the, you know, saying the starter package for the Backstreet Boys. Now, many people are wondering where Lou got all this money from. But back in the 80s, he used to work for a blimp company, Goodyear. You remember you used to see the Goodyear blimp? Well, he stopped working there and he started his own company. He was doing things for McDonald's, all kinds of different advertisements. So he had a warehouse and this is where the Backstreet Boys used to rehearse at inside of the warehouse that he had. It wasn't organized, but it saved money. And this is how Lou was getting his money at the time with advertising dollars. We get introduced to a guy by the name of Mark. Now, he said he met Lou back when he was 14 years old, back when his family didn't have anything. They lived in a one-bedroom apartment. Lou had the bedroom, and his parents slept in the living room on a pull-out couch. Now, he's saying that Lou was very talented back then. He actually forged his driver's permit for Mark. Now, he didn't do anything but put the ink in all of the numbers and all of the writing and forged the signature, but at least Mark had a driver's permit, courtesy of Lou. This is where the story gets a little interesting with the connections that Lou has. Now, they always said that Lou was a very good salesman. And here we are in front of the McBlimp. They got Ronald McDonald out here. McDonald's is about to do aerial promotions, courtesy of our man Lou. Now, the connection that he has is from a German Nazi pilot from World War II. Now, this guy, the German pilot who was a Nazi, Theodore Wollenkemper, he flew in World War II. Now, you hear Mark saying that this business deal between him and Lou was a little strange because Lou was Jewish, but he was getting the blimps made over in Germany by a Nazi, well, a former Nazi. Then we get introduced to another guy by the name of Jerry. Now, he said he met Lou in the building that they were living in New York. Now, he used to work on Wall Street, and he said it was kind of like the Wolf of Wall Street. He did his fair share of quaaludes. He had some ferrets, some weasels that used to run around. And he said that Lou used to be at all the parties, but he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't indulge in anything. But Lou had a lot of connections that he got through Jerry because he worked on Wall Street. Now, Jerry used his connections to get Lou with all of these Fortune 500 companies. Now, all of these companies that started supporting Lou comes to find out the mob was pushing them, the mob was behind them. So you can already see the path that Lou was on, but at this moment, no one really knows the type of business that Lou is really conducting because all they see is he has a couple of yogurt spots. He has a limo service. He has jets. He has blimps. He's about to start a boy band. He's just investing his money. Now that Lou raised $2 million for the blimps, well, now those same investors that we spoke about earlier, he's bringing his boy bands around. He's starting to have them sing in front of these investors. Same thing. Hey, I got a boy band. Would you like to invest in it? $100,000 here. Help us get some money for the shows. Help us go on the road. Help us do a little bit of touring. So Lou was a salesman 100% of the time. Now we're introduced to Frankie, another person that Lou brought in. Now, he was into aviation. And he used to work on motors and everything. And his parents end up moving into the Mitchell building. This is where Lou lived. And guess what? Lou was into aviation also. So for them to run into each other like this, Frankie, he just hitched on to what Lou had going on with the blimp. And he started working for Lou. Now, this is all going to tie in to the boy band once Lou puts this idea out there and tells him, hey, this is what we're doing. Now, Lou also had a scheme going on where you would invest in what he has going on, whether it's the boy band where there's the blimps, his yogurt. But Frankie ended up telling his mom, because she wasn't saving a lot of money while she was a school teacher, 
after he moved to Florida, hey, mom, Lou has this thing you can invest in. You get huge dividends. Now, you even hear Mark say he had all of us investing in it, even our family. So we were investing a large chunk of change into what Lou got going on because on the surface, Lou looked like a millionaire. So from there, Jerry gets Backstreet Boys together and he takes them over to Germany. Now, at this time, they weren't getting any love in the States. But when you went over to Germany, remember, he already had a connection over here because of the money man. Now, they go on little tours around Germany and the Germans were eating it up. Back then, you got to remember in the 90s, 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s, 2010s, the Germans, they hadn't really seen too many Americans past the war. Well, after the war, there was a, a gap. And then once these young men would come over, of course, the German girls, they love that. They love to see these American boys performing. And we know teenage girls love boy bands. So while they were in Germany, they were pop stars. They were becoming icons. Here in the States, we knew nothing about them. They're performing in front of five, ten thousand people. We knew nothing of them. Quiet as a mouse here in the States. But over in Germany, Munich, Cologne, Frankfurt, Trier, Stuttgart. All these places, yeah, Backstreet Boys were there. Now, if you look at this, they had records. They were winning awards. They were the Ignit over here in Germany. They were doing their thing. Of course, we still know nothing about them in the States. But Lou, he has them on this circuit, getting them prepared to come to America. Now, at this point, Backstreet Boys, they're just on Transcontinental. Lou's record label. But he's getting ready to put them in front of BMG and actually get them some funding. So when they come back to the States, they'll be ready to go with the promotion behind them. TV push and the radio. Now we see a young Justin Timberlake here, and they're getting into NSYNC. And the reason the NSYNC got brought up is because Lou said, if Backstreet Boys are about to be the next Coca-Cola, that means someone's going to be the Pepsi, the competition. So Lou took it upon himself Instead of letting someone else become the Pepsi to his Coca-Cola, why not make the next boy band group so he can compete amongst himself and he can make all the money with 1A and 1B, Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. So that's how NSYNC came about. He didn't want anyone to be the competition, so he made another group. Now, you pretty much hear the same story of how this group came together. You had Justin Timberlake. He knew JC because they were on the Mickey Mouse Club together. And at this point, Lou rented them a house. But the thing about NSYNC, they were on the hush. No one was supposed to know that NSYNC was secretly performing, secretly going on the road and doing these same little bitty shows the same way that Backstreet started off. And that's because Lou had the blueprint. Now, Backstreet, they were still in Germany. They're doing their little tours. NSYNC is quietly working up under the radar. And Lou kept telling them, shh. Don't tell nobody you guys are in this group. He had a whole independent house that he rented out just for them. And they were showing up, popping up at Lou's birthday party. Same thing, singing in front of investors, singing in front of any connection that Lou had, whether they're bankers, just large time investors, Fortune 500 companies, they were everywhere. Now we're starting to see Lou with his controlling tactics. The same thing he's seen going on with new kids on the block when he first started. He put in sync Backstreet Boys. He put them in limos. He put them on jets across the country, jet skis, whatever they wanted. But this was really a controlling tactic, showing these kids this is what you can be. You stick with me, Lou, Papa, you know what I mean? We're going to become stars, and you're going to have all of this. So the kids, they're living a better life than they ever had. So, of course, they're going to go along with this. They don't know the business. And this is the 90s. You couldn't just get up and Google Hey, what is a good contract? What to look out for in contract? Well, the time is right now. And back streets back. All right. Hey, this isn't the place where we judge people. We all knew the Backstreet Boys songs. Go ahead and comment in the chat if you knew a Backstreet Boys song or an NSYNC song. I'm pretty sure you knew one of them. They played it everywhere. But now they're back in the States. They got that budget behind them. The girls are going crazy. They're winning awards. They got the biggest songs. Hey. They couldn't be messed with. The only thing is Lou Pearlman, he had the competition right behind the curtains, waiting on their moment. Now it's time for NSYNC to step their self into the bright light. 
Well, Backstreet Boys, they're larger than life, winning awards, biggest songs. They just came off a tour from Germany. This is their first time home for Christmas in two years, and they want to rest. So this is the defining moment for when NSYNC stepped up to that big stage and they could look over to Backstreet and say, we're here. They performed at this Disney special because Backstreet, they wanted some rest. And right here is where NSYNC took off. And at this point, we got that two-headed monster headed up by Lou Pearlman. Now, with all this going on, Backstreet taking off, NSYNC taking off, Lou Pearlman is starting to get some fame, too, because everyone's looking at him. How the heck did you get two groups up and running in this short of time and both of them achieve so much success? He even had his own fan club. Now, if you listen closely, they say that Lou considered himself the sixth Backstreet member. There's five members that actually do the singing and dancing, and Lou considered himself a sixth. Remember when I mentioned earlier you couldn't just get up and Google what was a good contract? Well, everything started coming to the light when the Backstreet Boys realized that they sold all these records and they only got a $10,000 check. And Sync's looking at theirs like, wait a minute. $10,000, well, the group starts looking, where's all this money yet that we've been earning? You know, good things don't last forever. And now we get into the Ponzi scheme that was brought to us by Lou Pearlman. I've mentioned that this is the longest running Ponzi scheme in history. Well, everything's about to get uncovered in these next two episodes. Let's just say the money was a little funny. And they say you won't make a deal with the devil because if you did, he wouldn't show up as a devil because you wouldn't make the deal. So that was episode one, Lou Pearlman and how he got Backstreet Boys and NSYNC up and running. And now part two, we're going to go into the contractual agreements and how NSYNC and Backstreet are trying to get out of their contracts with Lou so they can continue on. Now, if you like this kind of content, I might do a more intensive dive into Lou Pearlman after these three. But if you like this kind of content, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Tune in tomorrow for part two. A Dirty Pop, the boy band scam. I'm ODIJ. We're on that road to 50,000 subscribers. Thanks for watching. I'm out. Jimmy on a beat, boy.